The ultimate appeal of the movement, therefore, is the chance to become identified with a power strong enough to overcome the domination of whites and perhaps even subordinate them in turn. In this context, although the black Muslims call their movement a religion, religious values have a secondary importance. They are not part of the movement's basic appeal, except to the extent that they foster and strengthen the sense of group solidarity. Malcolm X joined the Nation of Islam in 1947 while serving a 10-year sentence for larceny and burglary. Malcolm X was born Malcolm Little in Omaha, Nebraska and had a rough upbringing. His parents were active in the local Omaha UNIA chapter and were harassed by local white supremacists as a result. Malcolm's family moved several times for their safety, eventually settling in Lansing, Michigan. A series of events, starting with the death of his father and the extended hospitalization of his mother, left Malcolm and his siblings in foster care for many years. As a teenager, Malcolm dropped out of high school and entered the criminal world of pimping, drug selling, gambling, and theft, which led to his imprisonment. When he was paroled in 1952, he was made assistant minister of Temple No. 1 in Detroit. From there, Malcolm's speaking talents and striking appearance led to temple expansions around the country. He was a mentor to Louis Farrakhan, who would eventually be the leader of the Nation of Islam. Malcolm spoke at colleges and booked interviews on major news networks. The Nation of Islam, with Malcolm X as their spokesperson, became a critical voice in the debate about Black civil rights. He is widely considered the second most influential figure in the history of the Nation of Islam, second only to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Almost since the organization emerged, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, began infiltrating it to undermine its activities and assess whether it posed a violent threat. They attempted to scandalize the group by encouraging the publication of negative stories in the press, but this backfired. In 1959, television producers Mike Wallace and Louis Lomax produced a five-part TV documentary about the nation entitled The Hate That Hate Produced. The documentary exposed millions of Americans to the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X for the first time. Like their predecessor Marcus Garvey, who had met with the KKK in the 1920s, the Nation of Islam proclaimed common ground with the KKK, the American Nazi Party, and other white supremacist organizations. On January 28, 1961, Minister Jeremiah X of the Atlanta Temple and Malcolm X met with W.S. Fellows, a local leader of the Ku Klux Klan, and two of his associates. By this time, both the Nation of Islam and the KKK had been infiltrated by the FBI. One of the Fellows' KKK associates was actually an undercover FBI agent. Knowledge of the meeting has come from interviews from the participants and government documents. The KKK sent a telegram to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to propose a meeting to discuss their shared commitments, stopping integration and opposing race mixing. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad authorized Malcolm and Jeremiah to to meet with them devils, but required them to communicate nation stances on separation versus segregation and to demand land for a separate black state. The Nation of Islam had purchased farmland in Alabama, but the Klan responded by quickly buying up all the surrounding plots and the nation's cows were frequently found dead by gunshot wounds. The KKK members proposed making the Nation of Islam an auxiliary group. The KKK normally engaged in cross burnings, bombings, and other forms of domestic terrorism against black churches and their leaders. But in exchange for supporting the KKK's goals, Fellows reported that the Nation of Islam's temples and members would be given protection. The meeting eventually took an even darker turn when Fellows brought up Martin Luther King Jr. Fellows asked Malcolm and Jeremiah to disclose where King lived and to provide a schedule of his movements. Malcolm X firmly refused to provide any information that could harm his own people, even those with which the nation adamantly disagreed. Fellows tried to assure him, you don't have to kill him, we'll take care of the violence. Still, Malcolm and Jeremiah refused to give him any information. In February of 1961, at one of the nation's Savior Day events, they doubled down on their alliance with white supremacy by inviting American Nazi party leader George Lincoln Rockwell to attend. Rockwell donated $20 at the meeting. The next year, he attended the Savior Day event again and was allowed to speak. You know that we call you N-words, but wouldn't you rather be confronted by honest white men who tell you to your face what the others all say behind your back? I am not afraid to stand here and tell you I hate race mixing and will fight it to the death. But at the same time, I will do everything in my power to help the Honorable Elijah Muhammad carry out his inspired plan for land of your own in Africa. Elijah Muhammad is right. Separation or death. Rockwell's speech was greeted with a mixture of applause and boos. 
Three events likely contributed to Malcolm X leaving the Nation of Islam. Firstly, the 1961 meetings with the KKK and the American Nazi Party were deeply conflicting for Malcolm X. He had grown up seeing his parents harassed by white supremacists and believed such organizations were responsible for his father's death. When KKK members asked him to provide information on Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm's confusion increased. Malcolm X questioned why America's most racist and violent anti-Black organization was willing to offer the Nation of Islam Islam protection in exchange for information that could be used to harm Martin Luther King Jr. The fact that there were no white supremacist organizations opposing the Nation of Islam's message was disquieting. Secondly, in 1962, after long-standing tensions, members of the Nation of Islam had a violent clash with police in South Central Los Angeles. Two LAPD police officers beat two members unprovoked as they were exiting the mosque, and other members came to their defense. In the scuffle, one police officer was accidentally shot by his partner. By this time, 70 backup officers arrived on the scene. The officers beat random members and shot at least two members. One was paralyzed and the other was killed. In the aftermath, several members of the Nation of Islam were arrested, but no police officer was charged with a crime. Down in cold blood by the officer. He was unarmed. And uh, six other men were shot down in the same manner. They were unarmed. And every police department in America, including the FBI, no matter what criticisms they have of the Muslims who follow Mr. Muhammad, they admit that we do not carry arms. We aren't even allowed to carry as much as a pen knife or a fingernail file. At this particular point, at this particular point, it's not our intention to divulge what we intend to do. But I will say this, that no matter how much effort is put forth by the daily press to suppress the facts of the brutal murder of this black man and the cold-blooded shooting of these other six black men, the uh, press in Africa won't camouflage it. The press in Asia won't camouflage it. The press in Latin America won't camouflage it. These facts will be fed to them. And it, and it makes America look like an uh, 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 imbecile to send billions of dollars to all of these dark countries trying to buy their friendship and their sympathy and their allegiance and then shoot down black men in this country in cold blood and think that they can sell their form of the democracy or ideology to those people over there. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a vocal critic of the nonviolent civil rights protest movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. and racially integrated organizations. He taught his followers that this form of protest was tantamount to begging white people, who according to the nation's theology were inherently evil, to do something they would never do. He also believed the strategy of nonviolence was asking the black community to accept violence from white people. While he required his members to respect all constituted authority, whether it was white or black, he also taught that if a member was attacked first, they should fight back, even to the point of death. Enraged at the incident in LA, Malcolm X rallied more militant members and sought the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's permission to carry out a revenge plot against the police department. Malcolm X was shocked when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad refused his request. Malcolm asked if the nation could alternatively work with local civil rights organizations and leaders to respond to the incident. This proposal was also denied. The last factor in Malcolm's departure was the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad sent condolences to the Kennedy family and told Nation of Islam representatives not to comment on the president's death. However, when asked for comment on the assassination, Malcolm X said infamously that Kennedy's death was a case of the, quote, chickens coming home to roost, end quote. The backlash from his statement was widespread, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad swiftly suspended Malcolm X for 90 days. Malcolm had made similarly harsh statements before regarding plane crashes and accidents which killed white people without being reprimanded. This time, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad feared not only pressure from the U.S. government, but also the perception that Malcolm was operating as the de facto leader of the Nation of Islam. Though Malcolm's punishment was not permanent and didn't change his position or title, it would become a breaking point in a relationship which many regarded as like father and son. By that time, Malcolm had already begun to question the inconsistencies between the Nation of Islam's teachings and its actions. He had begun to talk to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's son, who was then named Wallace Dean Muhammad, about his doubts. Wallace had learned Arabic from native speakers who had worked at the Nation of Islam schools as language instructors. When he began studying the Quran, Wallace realized there were glaring contradictions between his teachings and those of his father. Namely, while his father taught that Master W.D. Fard was God incarnate, 
and Honorable Elijah Muhammad was God's prophet, Wallace learned that Islam strictly forbade deification of any human being. Orthodox Islam required Muslims to affirm that the 7th century figure Muhammad was God's last prophet. Wallace Muhammad was excommunicated many times for refusing to acknowledge Master Fard as God and his father as God's messenger. Additionally, Wallace Muhammad knew his father was not a prophet from observing his father's personal conduct. Wallace found out that his father had engaged in numerous extramarital affairs with women who had been punished as fornicators by the organization when they became pregnant. He shared what he knew with Malcolm X. According to his autobiography, Malcolm X had known about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's extramarital affairs as early as 1955. He used the Quran to explain these incidents away as a sanctioned practice of polygyny. The Bible is full of examples of polygyny and some Orthodox Islamic sects allow male members to have up to four wives. However, Malcolm X eventually questioned the treatment of the women involved. He believed that if these women were married to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad according to Islamic law, then they shouldn't have been disciplined by the organization. During this uh, court session, it was uh, concluded by all of Mr. Muhammad's followers that it was a non-Muslim who was the other party. Well, we grew so rapidly and that in 1957 or 58, the uh, secretarial staff was expanded to, I think, eight teenage sisters. In 1959, six of them disappeared. Two of them reappeared in Philadelphia about two or three months later, and they were all right. Uh, the other four reappeared in 1960. All four of them had babies. All four of them had uh, become involved with someone and become pregnant and had these children. And when I made the split, the only reason that I didn't make this public knowledge was I knew the implications, and I, I felt that if the uh, Muslims who were in the uh, Nation of Islam knew it, that which enabled them to be so strongly religious and uh, exercise moral discipline would be shattered and it would cause all of them to go right back and start doing the things that they had been doing previously. Who is the father of all of these various children whom you have enumerated? Uh, the first one to tell me who the father was was Wallace Muhammad and he told me that the father was Elijah Muhammad himself. And it was at that time he told me that he was Muhammad, the prophet, and that Muhammad had nine wives. He also told me that he was David, he was the modern David, and that he, that he was the modern Solomon and that he, he was meant, it was meant for him to fulfill today all of the things that they did back there. These sisters have been looked upon for the past uh, five years, or six years, or seven years as uh, being guilty of having committed uh, fornication. They have been debased, they have been degraded. I have, heard he, I have heard him, himself, refer to them as having disgraced him. So if they were his wives, he should have given them a position of respect so that all of his followers would re respect them and that they would have, his, have the protection of his followers today. Are you not, perhaps, afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. What but, do you mean? Uh, well, uh, when, you know, when you understand the makeup of the Muslim movement and the psychology of the Muslim movement, as long as uh, any, if I, I myself, in, by having confidence in the leader of the Muslim movement, if someone came to me and I had no knowledge whatsoever of what had taken place and they told me what I'm saying, I would kill them, myself. His followers are violent against Negroes. Against Negroes? Yes, his, his, his followers will go out and attack another Negro like they will attack me or they will, or they will uh, brutalize a fellow Muslim who breaks the law. But you don't find those same followers going out and becoming involved in the Negro struggle in any way whatsoever, and whatsoever. The willingness to make deals with white supremacists, the failure to act in response to the police violence towards members in LA, and the display of political pragmatism made it glaringly obvious that the organization's radicalism stopped with its teachings. Malcolm's flaw was perhaps that he had dared to believe that the Nation of Islam's teachings were literally true. Malcolm X realized the Nation of Islam was engaging in the same game as the Christian churches he had attacked for years, providing psychological comfort through theology in exchange for financial gain. He wanted to be involved in architecting solutions to the problems faced by the black community at large and not simply redirecting people's energy and finances towards one organization. On March 8, 1964, Malcolm X announced his split from the Nation of Islam. Almost a year later, on February 21, 1965, Malcolm X was shot and killed.